Welcome to the section on GraphQL. This series of short videos is intended to get you familiar with creating and using GraphQL APIs on the Now platform. It covers both built-in APIs and custom APIs. In this video, I'll give you an overview of what GraphQL is, and as a developer, why you should care. Let's get started. GraphQL is an HTTP-based protocol used to retrieve and modify data on a target system, sometimes known as a provider, in much the same way as SOAP or REST does. The advantage of GraphQL is that the payloads it transfers are generally much smaller, so performance is improved and costs potentially reduced. In many cases, there's a single endpoint to an API, since the real instructions are in the request body payload rather than different endpoints, HTTP methods, query parameters, and path parameters. The main components of the ServiceNow GraphQL API are the schema, the resolvers, and resolver mappings. We'll go into more detail on each of these in the upcoming videos. Like other protocols, the transaction is initiated from the client or consumer side. In the case of GraphQL, this is done via a query. I'm using that term generically here to indicate any type of request, when in fact, there are two types of requests named query, used to retrieve the data, and mutation, used to modify data on the target system. Let's do a quick comparison for those of you who are familiar with REST APIs. Where REST APIs typically have multiple endpoints or URLs to access information in different ways, GraphQL simplifies this with a single endpoint, often for a group of similar operations like case management, inventory, or return goods authorization. REST APIs use different HTTP methods like GET for retrieving information, POST for creating a new record, or PUT and PATCH to update, and of course, DELETE. GraphQL uses two types of requests, query to retrieve and mutation to modify. And because the request is always sent as part of the HTTP body, a POST method is always used, further simplifying the construction of new integrations. Another big difference is the way the response is sent from the provider. In most REST APIs, you get whatever the provider sends, despite how much of that information is actually useful to you at the time. Let's say, for example, you want to know the ServiceNow stock price. With REST, you would send a ticker symbol and make it back the current price, today's high and low, the 52-week range, market cap, PE ratio, earnings per share, and more, when all you really wanted was the current price. With GraphQL, the client or consumer specifies what is desired. If all you want is the current stock price, that's all you get back. I know this is a fairly simple and small example, but you get the idea where speed and cost are impacted when you scale this up. And here's another thing to note about GraphQL. The server or provider specifies what's available in the form of a schema. This gives the author control over what's being offered. Consider the example of the ServiceNow table REST API. You may use the sysparm under fields query parameter to let your third party know of some of the fields available, but if they're savvy, and have proper ACLs, they can extend that and read fields from the table that you may not intend. With GraphQL, you get better control over what's available. If the author of the schema didn't include it, you can't get it. It's as if that field or property doesn't even exist. As a quick example, here's the basic components of a simple GraphQL query. The first thing to note is that it almost looks like JSON with structured curly brackets, except there's no field value pairs. This is a query because it doesn't say mutation. In the absence of the query word appearing first, it's assumed to be a query request. Inside these first braces is the application namespace. This is a camel case version of the app scope name x under snc under mm in this case. Next we have hello world, the schema namespace. This is derived from the API name in much the same way that script includes use the name to create an API name. Inside the schema namespace, we have one or more query names. I like to think of these as functions that the API can perform. In this case, we'd like to run the get hello world function. Often these are named so you can easily tell what it is, like update customer, increment discount, or get all clients. Finally, we get to the properties we want. In this case, we want the message property from the schema. 
From this example, we don't know what else it has to offer. There could be more, but all we want right now, by looking at this query, is that the query requested the value of message. We'll get more into the details of a query and building out more complex examples in the next few videos. One more thing. New lines and tabs are optional. You'll often see these when building an API, but they're completely optional. Personally, I find the queries, especially longer, more complex ones, easier to read in this prettified format. But some providers may stipulate that new lines and tabs are to be removed. Later in this series, I'll show you a way to create and maintain readable queries that can be trimmed down if the producer needs that. That's a quick overview. Now let's get set up to do some building and testing in the next video.